Hi, so this is a um, quick uh, recording of the course we call Essentials of Getting Your Viz Online Successfully. It's aimed at journalists who um, would like to try some data journalism techniques and especially for the part where you're trying to visualize data in y yourself in, um, in new and creative ways that you might not have done before and, and how a lot of journalists don't traditionally do themselves. Um, now, visualizing the, the data and, and creating online visualizations and interactive uh, sort of um, presentations of data isn't really your end goal. Um, it's very easy to fall, fall into the trap of um, uh, creating visualizations just for the sake of it because it's flashy and, and exciting and, and I should take this chance to, to warn against that. Um, this is really for when uh, creating an interactive visualization of your data or presentation of your data um, really adds to the, to the story and, and helps people access the information in the story. Um, so don't just throw flashy graphics in there um, or, or add overly complex uh, interactives into your stories just because you can. But um, it's, it can be quite a minefield to navigate um, and understand how to get your um, your visualizations uh, online into a, a story into the web page and um, sometimes you'll be pre producing uh, content for um, online as well as for print or, or television or radio and um, then you have to keep in mind uh, what you're going to produce for them as well um, so yeah let's get started um, I'll make these slides available um, and add some notes it um, this um, these slides accompany a work um, a handout um, called testing your embeds um, with some guidance to, to try and help you try your embeds out online and I'll demonstrate a lot of what, what's there but uh, you also have the handout just to go through it at your own pace so you don't have to watch the video over and over uh, so let's start with the presentation um, so the format of this is really just a bunch of questions to start you thinking about what you're going to need. Um, it varies for every uh, media outlet and um, our goal is that any uh, journalist will be independent of, of us and their, um, their current media house so that they can pick up the skills and, and use them anywhere they go. That's why it's quite open and you really need to think for yourself um, how to get in place in, in the, um, uh, how to do what you need to do in your media house. Um, so if you're already producing stories, sometimes they might have graphics that accompany them. Um, other than images, photographs, um, perhaps some charts or something like that. Who would be producing those? Um, for, especially for print media, it's usually, there's usually a graphics team. Um, and they're all set up, it's been that way for many, many years. Um, so for online, it, it varies a bit. Uh, we find sometimes journalists uh, produce their own graphics, perhaps in Excel or something, um, and, and pass it along. Uh, and perhaps the, the media team might edit it before it goes online. Um, so, but um, you, you might not be producing your graphics t today. Perhaps you are already. Um, the next question is, who puts your stories on the website? Um, it's quite rare in our experience so far that uh, journalists are putting their, their story on the website themselves. Uh, usually, or in, in a lot of cases, it mirrors the sort of print process where uh, journalists would be um, writing the copy and passing it along to, to an editor who um, might give them some feedback and, and have a few rounds of, of edits before it goes um, goes to print and people are, often have a similar process for um, online where they would email their um, copy to an editor and um, eventually it might go online um, but it's not necessarily the editor who puts the, the story online so 
sometimes there's a um, a technical person or a person who who simply sits between the the editor and the the website or the journalist and the website um, and it's important to identify who that is because the person who puts it online is should really become your best friend um, they're the ones who who at the end of the day sort of clicks publish and um, you want to work with them to identify issues and sometimes you might have to make some alterations if it doesn't look right once the story goes online um, and that includes things per perhaps considerations like uh, layout if you want to have your um, your graphics or your interactives embedded in specific places in your story um, and so sometimes it's as easy as just saying I would like this positioned here but um, if Sur surprises can happen on the web because um, web publishing is quite complex and um, you don't always know precisely what you're going to get so uh, the ideal case really is that the journalist is putting it into the the content management management system and it goes directly online from there but if, it, if that's not the case where you work uh, you need to know who does that and uh, try and build up a good relationship with them um, and the next question is who do you send the copy to um, do you do you pass it straight to to an editor um, does the editor then pass it back to you with approval and then you you pass it along to go online or um, um, yeah and then uh, when do you send the copy um, the the workflow has traditionally been that um, you would write your story and sort of when it's close to done you would probably um, su submit it and we've heard that some journalists would submit it as late as possible as close as possible to um, publishing time especially when when they're publishing for print or um, they're, they're producing for print or when print and online are published at similar times um, so, and um, really with online you have so much more flexibility to to try things out and um, publish at any times um, and it's so much faster so you really don't apart from sort of organizational and political challenges and, and sometimes people are a bit lazy so they're trying to avoid um, getting last-minute feedback so that so they send it as late as possible but really um, you can you can get quite a few iterations in and, and uh, refine your story refine the layout once you see what it's going to look like on the web and when do you send your graphics um, if if it's a graphics team that produces it that that'll often be once the story is um, is pr produced once the copy is written and um, y you would sort of send your your story to the editor and you'd send your um, your request for for graphics to the graphics team um, if you're producing the graphics yourself um, and what I'm getting at is that you, you you'd like to try and um, check things out as early as possible because um, most web publishing platforms allow you to um, to try things out and see what it's going to look like so when you have an early draft you can see for a certain length of, of story uh, what it's going to look like how does it feel when when someone is looking at it um, do you do you have enough sort of uh, graphics to to break up the story a little bit um, do you need more pull out quotes um, does the does it flow properly with your with your visualization of the data um, but the question of, of when you send the graphics is really about um, does the graphics accompany your story when it's going out to to get ready to be published and um, so what do you need to send for a story with with an embedded uh, visualization or an interactive to uh, to go online uh, if you've never produced anything like this um, I'm not sure if you would have an answer to this uh, but 
obviously if you just have a, a photo or a, a static graphic of a, a chart or something that would often be um, you would just attach that image um, now it's very similar for um, for interactive graphics um, usually if you produce something online you would get um, a piece of HTML code and I can give a quick example of that um, so this website is just a bunch of examples of um, infogram uh, visualizations of data and um, just to give you an example so infogram is a website where you can make um, nice sort of presentations of data and it's it works well in the browser so it's a, a really nice place to play with it um, and to, to produce visualizations um, and they can be more or less interactive and so on um, so the way to get this online is actually to uh, into a website is to click share and then um, you've got three different examples of code this is HTML code um, and the default is usually quite safe um, so uh, they would just present them in different ways see so you can take the default one and then you just copy it and um, I'll just use this website to, to show how that then gets presented so um, when you supply that HTML code to your um, to whoever puts things online they would enter that somewhere into the the web publishing system perhaps with some copy here and um, some copy here and clicking run here is a bit like um, clicking publish and here you see what it's going to look like um, so when you're sending your copy to um, and, and you want to sit, attach your visualization to your media house you need to send in this code um, but you need to understand where to get that embed code that's called it embed code the html code um, you need to understand where to find that in whatever tool you're using to produce that um, visualization um, and I like to set this as, as, a, as an exercise just to, to draft an email to um, to whoever would be putting things online for you if that's the, the method where you get your, your stories online if you're publishing it yourself then you're obviously the one who um, who needs that so, so you, there's no point writing an email to yourself but um, but actually it's, it's an important exercise because a lot of the time people don't have these relationships set up yet and um, the people that you traditionally just sent copy to to get online probably aren't used to receiving this weird HTML code um, so and, and that's why it's so important to understand who are all the people at play so that you can warn them and prepare them that you're going to send them something like this um, it's also important, so what I'm showing you now is a, um, an email example that, that was used to uh, get one of the first stories in, in the, um, in the um, Data Journalism Academy at Code for South Africa um, online. Uh, and that was sent to, uh, I'm not sure what the role is, I think it was someone who uh, basically receives copy and stories from, from um, journalists, it could be, a, could have been an editor, and then places them online, and it says roughly here's the story, uh, or here's the embed code. Um, they sent the story separately, the the copy for the uh, the news story. Uh, they included me to uh, help with any technical issues that come up, um, and that's something we can do while someone is at the academy. But really, we need journalists to be independent from us once they they finish at the academy. Um, and then here is an example of embed code. Oh, um, now, this doesn't really mean much, and it's quite easy for this to, to kind of get broken if someone accidentally deletes something um, 
or with, with a few replies, you start getting a, a bit of a mess. So um, it's quite important to, to include this last line where um, they use this JS Fiddle website that I used before to, to show you an example um, of, of embedding the code to show someone what it should really look like. So um, when you just go to JS Fiddle, you get this bare URL and um, it's completely empty and you can enter the code there um, and you can click run and then you get this example of what it looks like um, and if you click save you would get an ID in this URL and now you can copy that and send it to someone else or I'm just opening up it up in a new tab and the other person will uh, once they open it up they'll see what it really looks like. Um, now, you'll have to warn them that sort of you have to look at the bottom right box for the preview, um, but the code that you want them to embed is in the top left box. Don't worry about the bottom left and top right boxes. Now, how do you think they'll respond when you ask them to, to put code into the website? And I ask this question because um, when you're a journalist and you're suddenly asking someone to put HTML into their, their website, um, they can either just say, no, we don't include HTML in the website. Um, and they're not completely unreasonable in saying so. Um, when you're including HTML in, in in a website like this, uh, especially when there's extra style and and uh, logic code that's included in that um, code, uh, you're basically inserting a second website in into the main website, and um, this code could potentially um, break the the presentation of the the main website. At the very least, when someone is actually reading that article that can sort of affect how ads are rendered and so on. Um, so it's, it's quite natural, especially for, for people who are slightly more technically minded to, to understand that this could, could harm the website, the, your, your publication's website. Um, so it's important, first of all, to, to trust the, the site that you're using to create these embeds. Um, and you'll get that trust basically from the community. Um, there isn't really anyone who will tell you that these are, are okay websites to, to embed, but um, a lot of the time you'll see Infogram, for example, is used on very large uh, publications. Um, so they can't really afford to, um, to do great damage. But sin since your website might not have been built with this embed code in mind, it's important to consider uh, to, to, to try it out before you publish. Um, make sure you, you test it somewhere where the public can't see. Um, and I really recommend doing that for every story and not just uh, once and then assume that that's how it works because um, your, your website code will, will change over time, for example, and also your um, your um, if you, if you produce a, diff a different visualization, that might include different things, it might have different um, size restrictions and so on. And um, as your, your story is sort of maturing and you're getting close to publishing, um, I tend to ask how often people check in with the, the people um, publishing the story at the end. and. Um, Usually, the, the responses I've had is that people only s send it at the end um, and that they perhaps have um, one or two small interactions, perhaps some, some editing changes, and then, then boom, the, the story is live, depending on the size of the story. Um, but if you, the, the, the cadence, the, the, the rate at which you're producing data journalism, journal, data journalism stories and if you're producing interactive visualizations yourself, it's probably going to be a bit slower, but with more engagement from the public and longer engagement from the public. And um, 
so but but there's also more work there are more variables there are more things where where you need to pay attention so it's really worth starting early sending an early example of your visualization and your copy trying it out in the in the web page and then um, uh, as your story is progressing and as you're changing things checking back in with with the um, the pu publishing team to to make sure that things still look good and and uh, work as you expect and um, it's amazing how many people don't know what it will look like when their story gets published and that's quite reasonable in print because there are people whose job is primarily to um, to do the print layout um, but on web um, it's only the the very oldest uh, sort of publishing platforms that don't allow you to uh, preview your story yet and unfortunately that that's often often going to be the case but it is almost always technically feasible to uh, get for a journalist to get an account and get permission to uh, to preview a story even if the journalist doesn't have the the, the technical permission to uh, publish that story which which might be uh, totally okay but it's really helpful when you start doing your own visualization and uh, perhaps start thinking about doing the layout in your code, uh, in your, your stories yourself, um, so that you can ensure that they flow well, that the, the graphics are positioned well with the text, um, and that your visualizations look the way you expect them to look. And even less than, than knowing what it um, what it's going to look like in general um, it's so crucial to know what it's going to look like on mobile um, so we, we're seeing that in South Africa between 50 and 60 percent of visitors to, to sites are mobile users um, that depends a little bit on the the type of publication and so on um, but uh, certainly it's it's massive and it's just growing and in africa mobile devices are are massive because of uh, the lower penetration of uh, desktop computers while um, very many people have access to a smartphone and that's growing rapidly um, and in um, in the first world there, there are simply sort of basically everyone has access to a smartphone, and they're reading news on the on public transport or um, at lunch or something like that. So it's you really can't not prepare visualizations for mobile, and um, it's actually really easy to test um, visualizations on mobile. JS Fiddle isn't the best tool for that. Um, in the worksheet, I show an example where um, we we tested on mobile, but um, I've just found a better tool for that. This um, uh, J here bin. Um, so this is the URL uh, beta.jhere.net slash bin and um, you can get a similar interface to JS Fiddle. Um, so once you get here, you can say show HTML and CSS. Then you would just get rid of all of these texts in these boxes. And now you would take your embed code as before and paste it into this HTML box. So it has to be the top right box in this one. And this is already showing you quite a narrow view. So just to give you an example, um, the um, the column width on a desktop site is already fairly narrow. Um, you can see here it's less than half the width of my computer. And if we open the story, there's the ad space and then the story space um, that and actually the story space is very narrow now in the Chrome browser and I think in Firefox and probably modern Internet Explorer you can um, 
use a feature called developer tools to see what a website is going to look like on mobile. So if you're in the menu, you would open more tools. No, sorry. Um, in the main menu, you would open more tools, developer tools, and then you have the web page on the left and some technical tools and a lot of complex things on the right. Uh, don't worry so much about the complex things and that sometimes this stuff is at the bottom and the story is at the top and um, with this menu you can then select to have that on the right where I think it's the most useful view. Um, and then this button can toggle between different devices so um, by default it's usually on the desktop mode so that's how we were seeing the story before um, but then if you select it you're suddenly in a mobile mode and you can try different mobile devices. So the iPhone 5 is, is um, quite a, a good example of a, a typical mobile today. Um, and you'll see here it's only 320 pixels wide. So right now this web page doesn't look great because it loaded on a desktop. Um, some websites if you reload it, it will see it's on a mobile, but no, it looks like Financial Mail is still not mobile friendly. Uh, you can kind of read it, but it would have been nice if they um, actually reformatted the page. So I'm going to do the same here to see what this chart is going to look like um, on mobile. Um, let's open developer tools. There you go. So now, because of these massive margins, because they were they mainly had desktop in mind when they built it, uh, the chart's gone extremely narrow. Um, the interactions still work reasonably. So instead of the the pop up on hover, you have the pop up on click now. Um, it's still readable, and that's the important thing. If this, um, if we take the static one, the fixed width one. Um, and we put that into the site. So let's just go back to desktop mode. So this is fixed width. Now you see you have to scroll off to the side. And if I open that on a mobile, this is really not a nice experience. And your um, web publishing team are not going to be very impressed if you provide them with um, embed codes that scroll off to the side because that can affect a lot of the layout on the web page. So there are two things to, to take um, to learn here. First of all, um, whenever possible, use a responsive um, embed code. Um, and sometimes you, you're going to have to keep that in mind when you're making your, your visualization in Infogram. So for example, don't have these massive margins or when you're putting it together, consider that the margins need to, to adapt to the width of the presentation. Um, and on Infogram, the responsive and the async tabs are both responsive. Async just loads in a different way and the fixed one is fixed width. But I tend to encourage people, if they really, 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 really have to use a fixed width tool, and um, the current free version of Tableau um, is um, only supports fixed width, then make it as, um, don't make it wider than 320 pixels, and really don't make it wider than 300 pixels because you want to be sure that it's not going to scroll off the page, scroll off to the side. Um, now, another thing to remember is if you do make it 300 pixels, and that's about the width of this section on this page, the related article section, if you make it 300 pixels, if the text doesn't flow around that box, then you're just going to have a, a, a nice blank box, um, which really doesn't look very professional. Um, you're going to have to trade that off against having that um, visualization in there from, from that tool. 
um, if possible see if your your web publishing team can help you to get the text to flow around it but the ideal really is to um, make sure that your visualization is responsive so use a responsive tool and I think Tableau 10 um, supports that so the Tableau I'm talking about is uh, this tool which we cover in the uh, later in the um, the Academy um, that's loading quite slowly now so Tableau is a fantastic tool for for presenting data unfortunately the free version is still only um, a static width and that's not really great for getting things online and working nicely on mobile as well as on desktop. Um, I think it's a lot of things to remember now, but try to just keep in mind that there there are a lot of things to consider. Um, and remember, test, 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 always test, always try to understand what it's going to look like, and ideally do that at an early stage in a story so that you don't put hours and hours of work into a visualization without actually getting uh, knowing that it's going to look right on your site and work with your um, web publishing team so that you can uh, make sure that it's going to look look right so that they're prepared for what you're going to give them uh, they might not have resources to to give to 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 modify the site to work with it so that's why you need to build up a relationship with them, warn them that it's coming, and um, and just try and keep everyone happy and, and positive to, to work together. Um, I've just demonstrated how to test that. Um, you need to consider whether it's also going to, to print. So if you're producing things for online, what do you want the, the print version to, to show? Are you going to supply them with a... Um, a screenshot of what you've produced are you going to repeat the work in some publications the um, the print um, um, the the print publishing team still use the um, the the print graphics team um, and if if they can receive your your interactive graphics and try and use static graphics to to guide the story in a similar way that's often very valuable and if you if the the interactive graphics really um, provide a huge sort of storytelling benefit perhaps it's worth trying to drive people from the the print publication to your online story so perhaps you might want to include a url in your print story to to say there's more to, to see and you can explore the data more if you visit the online story. But just keep in mind that you might have to prepare uh, graphics for different media. And the next question is what it will look like um, if your story gets shared on Facebook or Twitter. So there's something called Open Graph where um, if you um, um, where you can embed information into a website so that when you share it it looks good on your um, um, on, on social media so if I take for example this news story um, and I tweet it or I'm just going to use no I'll tweet it for real And if I expand this, I didn't actually get any example of that. Um, let's look at the open graph debugger from Facebook. And the reason I'm asking this is, um, or, or bringing this up, um, is that, that you can really make a, a story a lot richer by including this um, open graph data into your website. 
Um, so if you shared this on Facebook, for example, you would get this image with um, this title text and this description. Um, and that comes out of um, using these OG tags, so open graph data, uh, to tell Facebook and Twitter how to present that on, on social media. And if your publication doesn't provide that yet, it really, really should, because it, uh, uh, it can really improve sort of social media uh, engagement with your story. But also, perhaps you want to consider which graphic you would like to be presented there. It doesn't need to be your, your head graphic. Um, you can provide a different description there from, from the first paragraph in your story. If you don't, often it'll automatically pick the first image in the, in the um, website, which might be completely inappropriate. Um, the title might be something very generic like your publication's name, and the description might just be the first paragraph in your story. Um, or it could accidentally be the copyright text. So, so pay attention to that. Try that out. Visit this, um, this uh, sharing debugger or open graph debugger and try out publications on your site um, so that you know. And speak to the web publishing team to see if you can have control over how things get shared. If you can tr try and improve engagement there. And that seems to be the end of, of this um, presentation. So um, remember to, to have a look at the, the handout with more details on how to test things. And um, try it out as early as possible. Um, the, because every newsroom and every media house works differently, um, and different media houses would assign different resources to, um, to trying to make um, web publishing work and, and support journalists taking a more active role in, in, in the publishing process and the, the layout and presentation. Um, there isn't really a, a correct answer in, for a lot of these questions. You, you just need to be aware that there are a lot of issues here. It's probably not going to go smoothly the first few times. Um, but that's fine because you're learning and um, you, you're going to have to try it a few times and get feedback and figure out what the best way is to work with people. Um, try and, and get your, um, your publishing staff, the, the, the web, web development staff and the publishing staff to be um, friendly and open to, to trying different things. And, um, Testing is so important because A, it could affect their, um, how the site looks, which reflects upon the web developers, um, but it can also make or break your story. So um, you want to test it if at all possible and try and move your organization into a position where uh, you have more access to trying things out and exploring throughout the, the uh, development of your story. Thanks and uh, email if you have any questions.